good morning dear students uh, and welcome back today we are going to solve may june 2018 one one paper the course we are studying is physics 5054 and my name is farhan mazar let's start today's paper so here we have question number one on your screen let me increase the size so here we go which statement about electromagnetic waves is correct all electromagnetic waves have speed in air of approximately 3x per 8 meter per second this statement is correct in air some electromagnetic waves travel faster than light that's wrong in electromagnetic waves the electromagnetic waves with the largest wavelength are in the infrared region that is wrong the electromagnetic waves with the smallest wavelength are in the x-ray region that is also wrong so the answer and the answer the correct answer is a all electromagnetic waves have speeds in air of approximately three expo eight meter per second this is the correct statement question number one option is a a student wishes to measure directly the circumference of a football which is the most suitable instrument to use if you want to find out the circumference of a football it means the circle around the football the best instrument will be a measuring tape so the answer is b for question number two b is the option the best instrument for measuring the circumference of a football is a measuring tape so uh, question number three let me adjust his size yeah the diagram shows a satellite test traveling at a constant speed in a circular orbit around a planet P. Which statement is correct? The resultant force on the satellite is zero. That's wrong. The, result, the, the resultant force on the satellite is in the direction of the B. That is also wrong. You know the resultant force when you move in a circular path, the resultant force is always directed towards the center of that circle. The acceleration of the body which is moving in a circular path is also towards the center of that circle so the direction of the resultant force should be d the c option is the resultant force on the satellite is in the direction of the c that's also wrong the resultant force on the satellite is in the direction d the d option is correct statement the resultant force on this satellite will be towards the center of the circle in which it's orbiting so the d is the best option for question number three, D is the best option. Okay, on your screen, we have question number four. Which speed time graph represents the motion of a railway train making a short stop at a station? You see, these are speed time graphs. And in the speed time graph, when you stop for a short time, the speed time graph should come on the x-axis. For some time, it should be on the x-axis. So only the C is the right option. Question number four, C is the right option. You can see here the graph has touched the x-axis and for some time it remained on the x-axis, which means the speed is zero, which means the, the train has stopped for a short time. Okay, so the C was the option. We are moving to the next question. That's question number uh, five. He says, the minimum braking distance for a car is tested on a dry road. The test is then repeated on a wet road. What happens to the braking distance and to the frictional force between the tires and the road? The, when you are on a wet road, the frictional force will become less because the water on the road between the tire and the road will be acting like a, as, a, as a fluid and it will reduce uh, it, it will be acting as a lubricant and it will reduce the friction between the tire and the road. So the frictional force on the wet road will be less, it will decrease, and the braking distance obvious, obviously will increase. So on a wet road, it takes longer distance to stop the car. So the braking distance increase and the frictional force decrease. So C is the best option, sir. Question number five, C is the best option given here today. C is the option. Question number six on your screen, which piece of equipment is used to measure mass? Mass is measured with the help of the balance. So A is the best option. Very easy question. 
the body of mass 10 kg falling freely in the gravitational field close to the moon's surface has an acceleration has an acceleration of 1.6 meter per second square what is the gravitational field strength on the moon you see on moon there is no air so there is no air friction so whatever is the acceleration of the free falling body same is the gravitational field strength there but the units are different for the free falling body the acceleration is 1.6 meter per second square this was given in the question and the gravitational field strength will be the same 1.6 but its unit will be different newton per kg so b is the right option sir The graph shows extension load curves for four fibers. Which fiber is the most difficult to stretch over the range of loads shown? So here on the x-axis, we have load. On the y-axis, we have extension. For uh, you can, if you want to know which one is uh, difficult to stretch, for example, take this load. You see in D, very small extension is produced. In C, more than the D is produced in, in A is more extension produced and a b even more extension is produced so for if you apply the same load on the all the uh, a b c and d you see the smallest extension is in d so it means that the uh, the d is most difficult to stretch so d is the option sir d is the one which is most difficult to stretch so for question eight d is the option let me reduce the size okay so you can see the whole question okay here we come the diagram shows a muscle and bones in a person's arm the hand holds a load of weight 40 newton the elbow acts as a pivot and the tension in the muscle keeps the lower part of the arm horizontal what is the tension in the muscle due to the load try to understand this the tension here is a force which is acting upward and this elbow is acting as a pivot uh, the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the tension and the pivot is five centimeter here is the load the load is 40 newton it is acting downward and its perpendicular distance from the pivot uh, is 35 centimeter so this 40 newton is trying to produce a clockwise moment this tension which is a force is trying to produce a anti-clockwise uh, moment so both these moments are equal because the thing is in equ equilibrium so that uh, we will apply f1 d1 equals to f2 d2 clockwise moment is equals to anti-clockwise moment i've done this on a paper let me show you my work so you can see that uh, anti-clockwise moment is equals to clockwise moment f1 multiplied d1 equals to f2 multiplied d2 tension multiply 5 equals to 14 to 35 make the t subject of the formula and the t will be 280 newton so t is 280 newton i hope that you have understood this calculation we have applied the principle of moments and 280 newton the c is the option question number 9 280 newton c is the option i hope you have understood <clears throat> okay here we go question number 10 on your screen four objects of equal mass rest on a table the center of mass of each object is labeled g which object is the least stable underline this word he's asking least stable the object that will be the least stable will be the one which has the, the highest uh, center of gravity and whose base is smaller so b looks the best uh, option its uh, center of gravity is highest and its base area is smallest so b will be least stable when you do this kind of question underline this thing least stable and the same diagram and the question could be what is the most stable but here he has uh, asked us the least stable so that's why i'm saying underline this word least stable because same question same story but the question could be what is the most stable but here the question was least stable so b is the option 
Okay, so here we go. Question number 11. He says force of 4 newton and 2 newton act at a point. Which scale diagram shows the force uh, that have a resultant of uh, 4 newton? So look at the D option, 4 newton this way, 2 newton in this way. Their resultant will be never 4 newton. 2 newton like this, 4 newton like this. The angle between them, if you measure, it's a scale diagram. When you measure this angle, this will be 90 degree. <clears throat> and this will be the resultant according to the parallelogram. <clears throat> Sorry, this will be the resultant. This length represents 4 Newton. So measure it with the scale. This length will be not uh, equal to this length. Okay, so here apply the parallelogram law for addition. And the parallelogram law is already applied here. So the resultant is where the tails are joined. You join them with the opposite corner. You see, put a scale here. This will be the resultant. This this resultant length will be not equal to this length. So, but here, if you put the resultant will be this. Where the tails are joined in the parallelogram, if you want to add two vectors, what we do, we put them together in such a way that their tails are joined together. Then we suppose that they are the adjacent sides of a parallelogram. And then we complete the parallelogram. Then where the tails were joined, we join it with the opposite corner of the parallelogram and that represents the uh, resultant. So if you measure this length, this will be equal to this length. So B will be the option you actually have to do, use the scale. We were looking for that option in which the resultant length is equal to the length which is uh, representative of 4 Newton. So when I measure this length with the help of the scale, that length will be the same as this length. Okay, you can do it with the scale. I hope that you have a hard copy of this paper in front of you, then it will be very easy. So B, B is the option, sir. Okay. A student calculates uh, his power in running up a flight of stairs. He measures the vertical height of the stairs. The time, uh, the time taken to run up the stairs and his weight. How does he calculate his power? The power is actually the work done divided by time. The power is equal to work done divided by time. And uh, when you go upward, vertically upward, the work done is equal to weight multiply height. And for power, uh, work done divided by time, so weight multiply height divided by time, that will give you the power. Height multiply weight divided by time. So B is the option. Question number 12, B is the right option, sir. How does an oil-fired power station differ from a nuclear power station? In the nuclear power station, there are no greenhouse gases given out, no carbon dioxide is given out, no carbon monoxide is given out, no sulfur dioxide is given out. So the one big difference between the oil fired, you know, when, when you, you, you will uh, combust oil, the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide will be given out. So A option, gases emitted by hot fuel are emitted into the atmosphere. How does an oil-fired oil fired power station differ from a nuclear power station? Gases emitted by hot fuel are emitted into the atmosphere. That's the big difference. Steam is produced in a boiler using hot fuel in, in both cases. In the nuclear reactor, in the oil-fired power station, we use the boilers. The hot steam is used to turn a turbine. In both of the, those systems, we use the turbine. We use the hot steam to turn the turbine. Turbines are used to drive an electric generator in both of them. Uh, the electric generators are turned by the turbines. So B, C, D, these are the similarity between a nuclear power station and oil power uh, station. Only A is the real difference between the oil-fired power station and the nuclear power station. So A is the option. Question number 13, A is the right option, sir. Okay, let me re reduce the size so you can see. Okay. Five blocks have the same mass but different ba base areas. They all rest on a horizontal table. 
a graph is plotted to show the relationship between the pressure exerted on the table and the base area of the block. Which graph shows this relationship? You know the pressure exerted, the formula is pressure is equal to weight divided by area. So the relationship between the pressure and the area is inversely proportional. <clears throat> the pressure and the uh, contact area they are inversely proportional to each other and in all my videos i've told you this is the graph which will show our uh, inverse relation this this is not that graph please remember this thing this graph do not re represent our uh, inversely proportional relation between two quantities this is the graph which represents our uh, inversely proportional relation between the two quantities so D is the option. It's very easy question. Okay, let's increase the size. Okay. So here we have each tire of a car has an area of 100 centimeters square in contact with the ground. The car has a mass of 1600. Zero, zero, uh, Kg, the weight of the car is equally distributed amongst the four tires. The gravitational field, field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. What is the pressure exerted on the ground? You know, the pressure formula is weight divided by the total contact area. So the weight will be the mass into the G and the total contact area will be, because there are four tires, so it will be four into the contact area of one tire. I've done this on a paper, let me show you. So I hope you can see on your screen. Uh, I hope uh, if it's visible on your screen, it's still not coming. Okay, now it's visible. You can see the pressure is equals to weight divided by area and uh, the weight is 1600 kg multiplied with the G value that's 10 divided by four. Why four? Because there are four tires and uh, it will be four into 100 and the final answer will be 40 Newton per centimeter square. 40 Newton per centimeter square is the answer. Okay, 40 Newton per centimeter square was the answer. So C is the choice. Question number 15, C is the right choice, sir. The diagram shows a simple mercury barometer which height is a measure of the atmospheric pressure. We have told you many times in all our videos, this is a diagram of a barometer. So which height of the mercury is representing the atmospheric pressure? It's the level of the mercury in the tray and the level of the mercury in the tube. The difference between these two levels is the is a representative of the atmospheric pressure. So C is the right option. Question number 16, C is the right option. This height of the mercury in the tray and height of the mercury in the tube. So the difference between these two levels is, is representing the atmospheric pressure in, uh, uh, in meters of HD or centimeters of HD. So C is the right option. What is described as the escape of more energetic molecules from the surface of a liquid? That's evaporation, simple. Evaporation, B is the right option. In evaporation, the more energetic molecules leave the surface of the liquid and less energetic molecules are left in the body of the liquid. Okay. The diagram represents four thermometers. Which thermometer has the greatest sensitivity and which thermometer has the greatest range? So the greatest sensitivity is there where they're in the same length of the thermometer, we have the uh, smallest range. So you see this from 30 to 40, it has just uh, 
10 degree centigrade in the same length and so it will be the the most sensitive the q will be the most sensitive and the most the most range which goes from 0 to 250 so its range is 250 it goes from 100 to 300 its range is 200 this is going from 0 to 25 so its range is 25 so the greatest range is here in r and the most sensitive is q q and r c is the option Question number 18, C is the right option, sir. Okay. What happens when a solid is, uh, what happens when a solid is heated and expands? And what happens when a solid is heated and expands only its molecules move away from each other? He says the molecules do not change size and the spaces between the molecules become larger. It is the right option. He says the molecules expand and the, the molecules do not expand. So that sentence is wrong. C also, he says the molecules expand, the molecules never expand. D, the molecules expand. Oh no, the molecules don't expand. So A is the right option, sir. The molecules do not change size and the spaces between the molecules become larger. So uh, in the next question, question number 20, when a piece of smoldering rope is held at the opening of the box in the diagram, smoke moves in the direction indicated. What is the responsible uh, for the movement of the smoke? You see, when you put a candle here in this second opening, the air here, it becomes hot, its molecules move away from each other, and this air becomes less dense and this air rises upward. The cold air from here sinks in, and due to this a convection, currents are set in. So this smoldering, uh, from this smoldering rope, the smoke is sucked in, and from here it goes out due to convection. So the smoke's movement is due to the convection. A is the option. Question number 20, A is the right option, sir. The diagram shows four identical cans with their outside surfaces either polished silver or painted dull black. Each can contains the same volume of water initially at 80 degrees centigrade. After five minutes in a cool room, which can contains the coolest water? Where will be the most temperature drop? Uh, the container who is open? and whose outer surface is dull black because the dull black is a very good emitter of infrared radiation. So A will be the best. A will have the coolest uh, water. So A is the option, sir. Okay, question number 22. The diagram shows two divergent rays of light from an object O being reflected from a plane mirror. At which point is the image formed? If you have this hard copy in front of you, take a scale and do as I am saying. So put a scale along this line and prolong it behind the mirror. Put a scale with this reflected ray. Put a scale with the, this reflected ray and prolong this line behind the mirror where those these two prolonged lines lines intersect you will see the image so b is the option if you will do this you see here you actually have to do this so then you will be 100 percent sure that where is the image formed so b is the right option if you have a hard copy of this paper in front of you take your scale and do this uh the, the, do this construction which i have told you so b is the option sir which statement is correct total internal reflection only occurs when light travels from air into glass no total internal reflection occurs when the light travels from a dense medium into a rare medium so a is not possible the larger the refractive index of glass the larger is the critical angle mm. uh, this is a statement which is very tricky so leave this statement 
when total internal reflection occurs the angle of incidence is equals to angle of reflection that's 100 percent true when the total internal reflection takes place then then the angle of incidence is equals to the angle of reflection when uh, total internal reflection the, the d option uh, when the total internal reflection occurs the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle. that's wrong so C is the best option about B. We are not sure because you have to do some mathematics to check whether this is true or not. But C is a hundred percent correct statement. So we were looking at statement which was hundred percent correct. So we were about C. We are hundred percent sure. So C is the right option. When total internal reflection occurs, the angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. The diagram shows the path of two rays from the top of an object through a lens. The object is viewed from the opposite side of the lens to the object. How does the image compare with the object? You know, this is a diverging lens and we have studied in the chapter of light that the diverging lenses, uh, they always form virtual image. They always form upright image, same way up and they form diminished images the images formed by the, the diverging lens are virtual they are diminished and they are upright they are erect they are the same way up as the object so smaller and the same way up so d will be the best option sir question number 24 d will be the best option <clears throat> a young person with healthy ears can he hear a range of frequencies. What is the approximate range of frequencies? The audible frequency range of a normal human ear is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So D is the option. Question number 25, D is the option. It's a fact. Okay. Question number 26 is on your screen. The diagram shows a loudspeaker that is producing a continuous sound wave of frequency 200 hertz in air. So which diagram best shows how the sound waves cause a molecule at P to move during one by 200 seconds? So here we have loudspeakers producing sound wave, the sound waves, and this is the particle in the air. So the sound waves are going in this direction and you know the sound waves are longitudinal waves yet produce compressions and rarefaction and the particles of the medium in which the sound wave travels they vibrate parallel to the direction of the wave so if the wave sound waves are going towards the right the air particles like p particle here it will be vibrating parallel to the direction of the wave so it will go to the right it will go to the left it will go to the right it will go to the left so they will be vibrating to and fro left to right so a is the option sir question number 26 a is the option a is the right option this is how the particle on point p should be vibrating when a sound wave will pass here from left to right so the particle should vibrate parallel to the direction of the sound wave So next question is on your screen. The diagram shows an alarm system. What happens when the battery P is connected? Here, try to understand this diagram. So here I have a battery P when this is connected. Here we have a solenoid. This solenoid will become an electromagnet. When this will electromagnet, magnet, it will attract this iron armature. So iron armature will remain in air. So if you disconnect this battery P, so what will happen? This will be no more an electromagnet. So due to the weight of the iron armature, the iron armature will go down. It will touch this contact and the current in this second circuit will be completed and this bell will start ringing. So if you disconnect the battery P, what will happen? The iron armature will fall down and the bell will start ringing. So A is the best option. Question number 27A is the best option. I hope that you have understood 
all the story here. The an electric uh, current in a wire is into the page. Which diagram shows the shape and direction of the magnetic field around the wires because the current is into the page. So apply your right hand rule. Your thumb should be in the direction of the current. So I apply the right hand. This is my right hand. And I will apply the right hand rule. So current is going into the screen. Where I see from here. The magnetic field should be clockwise. The magnetic field should be clockwise. And you know another thing that the, the circles, it will be a circular magnetic field around the conductor. It should be clockwise and they should be concentric circles and the circles which are near the coil, near the wire, sorry, they should be close to each other. And the circles which are away from the wire, the distance between the consecutive circles should be larger. So the best representation is C. So question number 28 is the C is the option. C, this one is the character. You see here the circles are close, but when as you move away from the wire, the distance between the circles becomes larger because when you are near the wire, the magnetic field is stronger, but when you move away from the wire, the distance becomes, uh, uh, the magnetic field becomes weaker. So the distance between the uh, circles should be larger. So C is the best option. A copper wire X has the resistance R, another copper wire Y has twice the length and half the cross section area of X. What is the resistance Y? So both of them are made of the same, same material. So their resistivity will be same. Resistivity of the first wire and the resistivity of the second wire will be same. So let me show you how we calculate this. You see here, question number 29. I hope it is visible on your screen. The resistivity of the first wire and the resistivity of the second wire will be equals to each other. The resistivity is represented with R1, A1 by L1 and the resistivity 2 is represented with R2, A2 divided by L2. So R1 is R, capital R, area 1 is A, the length 1 is L. R2 is question. Area 2 is half the area of the first wire. And the length 2 is double the length of the first wire. So you see A and A will be cancelled, L and L will be cancelled. If you make R2 alone, it will be equals to 4R. So the resistance will become 4R. 29, the resistance will become 4R. Question number 29, sir, D is the right option, 4R. I hope you have understood the method by which we have calculated the resistance of the second wire. The basic theme was because they both the wires are made of the same material, so their resistivity will be the same. Resistivity of both the wires will be same. That's from where I cracked this question. I hope you have understood. In the circuit shown, the temperature of the room and the amount of light affect the current. Under which conditions is the current in the circuit the largest? The current coming from the battery will be largest if these largest if these two have the, the circuit have the smallest resistance. These two are connected in series. So if I want the smallest resistance so that the current will be the largest from the battery. The thermistor should have the smallest resistance and the LDR should also have the smallest resistance. Thermistor resistance depends upon the temperature. So if it is in the cold condition, the resistance will be very high. But if it is in the hot conditions, the temperature is high, the resistance will be low of the thermistor. So the resist temperature should be high for the thermistor resistance to be low. And for the LDR, the LDR's resistance depends upon the light falling on it. If the, it is in the bright condition, this resistance will be low. And if it's in the dark condition, this resistance will be high. 
but we want low resistance so it should be in the bright condition so the temperature should be high and the amount of light in the bright light so a looks the right option sir question number 30 a is the right option a the temperature should be high thermistor will have lowest resistance and the amount of light it should be in the bright light the ldr will have the low resistance when they both will have the low resistance the total resistance will be low and the current coming from the battery will be greatest or largest temperature should be high and the amount of light it should be in the bright light so a is the right option An electric, an electric appliance is plugged into a socket in the wall. The plug contains a fuse, which is the main, what is the main purpose of the fuse? The fuse actually do not let the wiring get overheat. If a large amount of current starts flowing, and obviously when the current flows, the heat effect is produced, the heat is produced in the wires. So it do not let the overheating takes place to, pre to protect the wiring from the overheating. So D is the option, sir. Question number 31, D is the right option. A horizontal beam of electrons passes between the two poles of a magnet. So it's a beam of electrons passing from a magnetic field. Here I have the north pole, here I have the south pole. So magnetic field is downward. The beam of electron is going this way. In which direction is the beam, of, uh, is the beam deflected? Apply the left hand rule. Play means left hand rule, sir. Stretch the fingers, FMC force magnetic field current so the magnetic field is downward so the magnetic field is downward and north to south is going downward and the current is going in this way beam of electron my thumb is pointing into the screen but there's a problem this law is for positive charges this predicted that the the it should be banded into the page but this law is for the positive charges is not for the beam of electrons which are negatively charged so the beam of electrons will bend opposite to what the left hand rule has predicted so left hand rule predicted that the beam of electron will be banded into the screen so the beam of electrons should be deflected out of the screen out of the page b is the right option I hope you have understood this. I applied the left hand rule to find the direction of the deflection of the charged particles. But you know uh, that that left hand rule is for the positive charge. It, it is not for the negative charge. So whatever is the direction predicted by that uh, left hand rule, you will answer opposite to that because we are dealing with electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. So B is the right option, sir. I hope you have understood. Which diagram shows the voltage output V against time T for an AC generator? The, AC, the output of the AC generators is alternating current. So it goes into the positive voltage and it also goes into the negative voltage. So the graph is the standard graph of the AC generator output is D. It's a famous question, question number 33. D is the right option, sir. D is the right option. It's a famous graph. This is the graph which represents the alternating current, the output of an AC generator. D is the right option. A loudspeaker and a microphone are placed in front of a wall. The loudspeaker makes a sound which is deflect, uh, detected by the microphone. So what will happen? This loudspeaker will produce a sound. This sound will go and it will be deflected from this wall and will come back. And here we have a microphone. That microphone will uh, detect that echo. The loudspeaker makes a sound which is detected by the microphone. The microphone is connected to an oscilloscope which is set so that each division on the screen represents 0.01 second. The microphone detects the original sound and the echo. So here we have the original sound and here we have the echo and display on the oscilloscope. 
the speed of the sound in air is 300 meter per second what is the distance between the loudspeaker and the walls you see from the cro screen i can tell the time lapse between the original sound and the echo let's count so one two three four five six seven eight so there are eight horizontal squares between or eight horizontal divisions between the original sound and the echo so once division represents 0.01 second so the total time lapse between the echo and the original sound is 8 multiplied 0.01 second so it will be 0.08 second and the speed of the sound is given to us that's 300 meter per second what is the distance between the loudspeaker and the wall the low uh, the sound took the time which you just calculated 0.08 second is the time of sound going from the loudspeaker to the wall and coming back to the microphone so it was 0.08 second so we hope that uh, in in just going from loudspeaker to the wall the time taken will be half of this time it will be 0.04 second multiply it with the speed of the sound that speed multiply time and you will get the distance i've done this on a paper let me show you my work i hope you can see this on the screen the time is 8 into 0 0.01 it is 0 0.08 second time to reach the wall only not just go and come back just to go from loudspeaker to the wall is 0 0.08 divided by 2 and it will be 0 0.04 second so the distance is speed multiplied time the speed is 300 and the time is 0 0.04 and the answer is 12 meters so the distance between the loudspeaker and the wall is 12 meters So 12 meters, so B is the option. Question number 34, B is the right option, sir. This circuit diagram shows a variable resistor R connected in parallel to the lower half of a potential divider. The resistance of R increases what happens to the two volt meter readings if this r will increase the resistance here will increase so the reading on this volt meter 2 will increase and the reading on the volt meter 1 should decrease because the emf is equal to v1 plus v2 the emf has not changed so some of the v2 and the v1 should not change but if the resistance r will increase the total resistance here will increase so the, this V2 is reading the voltage drop on these two. So that the V2 reading should, should go up and the V1 reading should go down. So the V1 reading should decrease and the V2 should increase. So B is the option. Question number 35, B is the right option. Okay. The thin aluminum foil is used in cooking. The diagram shows a system used to control the thickness of the aluminum foil uh, being made in a factory. What is the most suitable radioactive source for the system? You know, this is a thin aluminum foil. And uh, in, the, in the given options, we have beta and the gamma. The gamma cannot be used because, you know, the if it's thin foil, the, uh, I will not be able to stop the gamma rays. The aluminum foil will not be able to stop it. So we will use the So, uh, so I am back, uh, dear students, uh, due to inter internet connectivity, there was some problem, so we can do this question again. The aluminum foil is used in cooking. The diagram shows the system used to control the thickness of the aluminum foil being made in a factory. So here we have, we are trying to check the thickness of the, of the aluminum foil. We want to make sure that the thickness is uniform. So here we have a radioactive source and here we have a radiation detector. The source should be emitting beta or gamma in the options. 
we cannot use a source which is giving out gamma because you know the gamma uh, the aluminum will not be able to stop it aluminum cannot stop gamma rays so there is no point of using the gamma because it's a thin aluminum foil so beta is the best option so use beta because beta if uh, is the one which can be stopped with the aluminum because the aluminum file is very thin so the beta is the best option uh, beta can penetrate through aluminum but if the thickness of the beta becomes uh, if the thickness of the aluminum becomes larger then uh, the beta will be stopped so use the source of beta whose half life or whose half life is uh, very long so for example 6 years so b is the best option question number 36 b is the best option so on your screen we have question number 37 which of alpha beta and gamma radiations are waves only the gamma is a transverse wave alpha and beta both are particles so gamma only so c is the right option question number 37 c is the right option question number 38 a radioactive isotope of hydrogen has a half life of 12 years a sample contains 40 million, million atoms of this isotope how many atoms of this isotope are left after 24 years so you see the half life is 12 years and he says how much uh, the original atoms will be left if the half life becomes 24 years i've done this on a paper you see if in the start there were 40 million and after 12 years they will become half so it will become 20 million another 12 years will pass and it will further half so 10 million so after total 24 years 10 million atoms will be left so the answer is 10 million so b is the right option 10 million is the question on the half life Question number thirty-nine is on your screen. How many nucleons are in one neutral atom of the krypton isotope thirty-six eighty-four? Nucleons is that eighty-four? Eighty-four is actually representing the nucleon number. So C is the right option. Question number thirty-nine. C is the right option. Eighty-four. Question forty on your screen. A radioactive nucleus is represented by U ninety-two two thirty. which row represents an other isotope of the same element the isotope will have the same proton number but different neutron numbers same proton number the only option here which we where we have the same proton numbers is c the isotope is that those elements which have the same proton number but different neutron numbers So C is the right option. Question number forty. C is the right option. Okay. So, my dear students, by this question we have reached the end of this paper, and you know uh, today we have solved the May June two thousand eighteen one one paper, and the course we are studying is physics five zero five four. my name is farhan mazhar i hope that this video is helpful in improving your concepts of physics and improving your answering skills and getting the better grades i hope this will be very helpful to you thank you very much everybody have a good day and go